G'day everyone, my name's Ebony Bennett. I'm the Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, Canberra's Ngunnawal country, and sovereignty was never ceded. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, and also to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us on this webinar today. We did have, uh, uh, I think, more than 1,500 people uh, registered today. So uh, welcome to everyone who's participating. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Australia Institute is one of the country's most influential independent think tanks based in Canberra, as I said, and uh, welcome. We're so glad that you could join us today. During the pandemic, we are aiming to do these webinars at least weekly, but days and times do vary. So make sure that you're subscribed at tai.org.au forward slash webinars so you don't miss out. Just a few tips before we begin to help this run smoothly. I'm sure you're all veterans of Zoom meetings now, but if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A button where you can ask questions of our panelists. And you should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments. Uh, we will take questions in the second half of this webinar. So if you'd like to ask yours of the panel live, use the raise your hand function and the little hand emoji will appear beside your name. Please keep things civil in the chat, otherwise we'll have to boot you out. And just a final reminder that this discussion is being recorded. It will be posted on our website afterwards and we'll send a link around to all of you uh, who are attending today. Um, but just a reminder that yes, it, it is being recorded. Uh, so I'm really delighted about today's topic and today's guests, and I really can't do better to introduce today's topic than to quote from the back of Thomas Frank's new book, which I have with me here, available in all good bookshops in Australia, People Without Power, which says, populism today is seen as a frightening thing, a term pundits use to describe the racist philosophy of Donald Trump, and European extremists, but this is a mistake. And Thomas Frank is here to tell us that everything we think we know about populism is wrong. He's an historian and author of this new book, People Without Power, The War on Populism and the Fight for Democracy. He's also the author of Listen Liberal, Pity the Billionaire, The Wrecking Crew, and What's the Matter with Kansas, which asked, why do so many Americans vote against their economic and social interests? He's a former columnist for the Wall Street Journal and Harper's, the founding editor of The Baffler, and he writes regularly for The Guardian, and he's joining us today from Kansas City. And today he's joined in conversation by Wayne Swan, ALP National President, former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and the Treasurer who helped Australia avoid the last recession during the global financial crisis. And of course, my boss and the Executive Director of the Australia Institute, Ben Oquist. Welcome, Ben, Wayne, and Thomas. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Ebony. Yeah, good to be here. Um, Thomas, we might start off with you. You've got this new book. Congratulations on the book. I am only uh, a couple of chapters in at the moment. And I will say again, you can buy it from all good bookstores uh, here. But uh, it's obviously a, a, an incredible moment to be talking about populism. Why did you decide to write the book? <laughs> That's a really good question. By the way, I got to ask you, uh, does the Australian edition have the illustrations in the middle? The, uh, the, uh, uh, well, you know, they, they, should, they should pop right out at you. Well, even if it doesn't. <laughs> the, uh, so I'm from uh, I'm Kansas. I'm actually speaking to you from Kansas. And about 20 miles from where I'm sitting right now, uh, the word populist was invented. It happened one day in the year 1891. It was a, you know, this is a uh, a, a man-made word. We know, you know, it was a coinage that was deliberately invented on a train ride between Kansas City and Topeka. And it's, it's always had an important part in my, um, my understanding of the world and the way I think about things. And it's, well, not just for regional pride. It was one of the very, very few things that Kansas can be, you know, that Kansas can be proud of having invented, you know, of having originated was this word, populism. But it, it, it's also because it describes something that at, its, at, the, at the time was unquestionably noble, positive, democratic. It was a, uh, it was a mass movement of farmers who were a really uh, beaten down class in America at the time in the 1890s. And they, they came together to challenge the sort of um, uh, you know, political elites in various states. The first state where they went into politics and started a third party, which came to be known as the Populist Party, was right here in Kansas. And they managed to defeat the local Republicans 
and, uh, you know, and, and went from triumph to triumph. Now they had a whole, you know, they made their demands very well known, the populists. They had a manifesto, it was very famous in its day. And if you were to go back and you can find it online, it's very easy to look up. And if you, if you look at it, it looks like extremely sensible demands. This is one of the, it's the equivalent of the British Labour Party and the Australian Labour Party, the German Social Democratic Party. They were all coming up at the same time, these left-wing parties that uh, tried to represent uh, workers. And the demands that the populace made are extremely familiar because we've realized almost all of them. They wanted, you know, um, they wanted the secret ballot. They wanted votes for women. They wanted government regulation of railroads. Uh, they wanted, you know, to get us off the gold standard. That was a big one at the time. They wanted the government to regulate banks, you know, right, right on down the list. Sort of all the things that we have. And if they wanted a, a really robust farm program, too, of course, all the things that at the time were, were utterly unthinkable to the economic establishment. You know, at that time, what the American government owed to uh, its you know, citizens who were suffering through hard times was absolutely nothing. The American government did nothing for those people. The government existed to make sure that the market you know, functioned in a certain way and that corporations did all right. And populists were the first to challenge this. And populism was eventually met it went, you know, it, it uh, had its various successes and was eventually met with a kind of upper class hysteria in this country and was, was beaten down in the year 1896. And that hysteria involved, and this is where the story becomes really peculiar, that hysteria involves all the different sort of uh, ideas and phrases that we associate that we attach with to populism nowadays, even though the meaning of the word populist has completely shifted by 180 degrees. Instead of being an anti-racist party, now we use the word to describe bigots, uh, etc. Well, you know, I just read Donald Trump's. Uh, Donald Trump nominated a woman to the uh, Federal Reserve Board who wants to put America back on the gold standard, which is particularly <laughs> hilarious because the populists were, the gold standard was their nemesis, right? It's, it's completely the opposite, what we call populism today. But the attacks and the insults with which the elite of 1896 met populism are exactly the same ones that are used against it today. In other words, it's uh, a movement of people of, of the lower orders who have no business uh, having any kind of say in government. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an anti-intellectual movement. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of pathology. It's a social pathology. In fact, it's a form of mental illness right on down the line. And you can trace these things through the American, you know, the backlash against populism in 1896. Now here's the I'm gonna and I'm gonna wind this up. I'm not, I don't I don't mean to talk too much. I I tend to I tend to really uh, run on when I talk about uh, these these sort of wonderful chapters of American history. By the way, if you go to my website tcfrank.com, I've got all the illustrations of this campaign against populism in 1896, and they are some of them are really blood curdling. I mean, they're really alarming. Like one of them shows uh, the presidential candidate of the populists uh, as, as an immigrant with a big knife and he's just assassinated Lady Liberty and she lies bleeding on the steps of the U.S. <laughs> Treasury. It's quite insane. But anyhow, this goes on to this, to this day. And so the question that I asked in the book is, uh, how did the meaning of the word flip? When did that happen and how did it happen? And uh, and uh, what I found, I'm, of course, I answered that question. It happened in the 1950s with a new, sort of new generation of intellectuals coming up in America. And they had joined the elite themselves. And they wanted to come up with a word to describe, um, well, let me take a step back. They represented sort of managerial, um, you know, uh, profession, the sort of uh, the, the, the rise of the professions into the places of power in, the, in American life. So people with MBAs were taking over the corporations, were running the corporations now, instead of, you know, uh, millionaires or something like that. Uh, people with advanced degrees were running the government in Washington. People who, who uh, understood political science, you know, who were, had PhDs in political science were running the Pentagon now. There's, a, you know, Robert McNamara, the Vietnam War, all that. And there was a generation of intellectuals coming up who were saying, yes, you know, writing manifestos for their generation. They said, this is the end of ideology. We have figured the world out. We know how to deliver prosperity, you know, through managerial, you know, through managerialism in the professional class. We are going to, you know, deliver this sort of wonder world. And they wanted a word to describe uh, their foe, what they were displacing. 
the mass movements that had built the American left, the labor movement, uh, the, the farmers movement, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted a word to describe the folly of that history that they were now overturning. And they settled on populism and they built up a stereotype of this historical movement in the 1890s that was historically completely incorrect. And I mean, it was refuted very quickly in the, within the American historical profession. It was, you know, utterly lay in ruins within five years. But their, their sort of demonizing of populism as, you know, using the same terms as in the 1890s, anti-intellectual, pathological, mentally ill, and then they added to that racist, uh, that caught on. And that vision is now everywhere in the world. You see it all the time. It's in the New York Times every single day. I mean, I, I'm sure you, you hear it in Australia constantly. And okay, this is the last point I'm gonna make and then I'm shutting up, I promise, okay? This is the crazy thing. There okay. is a, although the word populism has changed its meaning completely, there is a total continuity from the anti-populists of 1896 to the anti-populists of today. They describe their foes, the sort of the lower orders, you know, who need to stay in their place, this fear of democracy, this fear of mob rule in exactly the same terms. It's, it's absolutely uncanny. Anyhow, that's what, uh, that's what the book's about. Uh, and as I said, I'm only a few chapters in, but I can highly recommend it. It's an engrossing read so far. Um, Wayne Swan, uh, Thomas has talked about the, the, the history and the analogy with um, movements such as the Labor Party in Australia. Where's populism in Australia today? Well, I think uh, when it comes to the Labor Party, we're traditionally where we were in many ways uh, in the 1890s. Uh, that is, uh, we uh, oppose what I'd call the tired, old, stale, trickle-down agenda that uh, Thomas was talking about before that came through uh, in the 50s and has dominated so much of the policy and ideological debate uh, since then. So uh, the Labor Party uh, is a party which is uh, based uh, on the trade unions and, uh, and also membership broadly dispersed across the country that believes uh, not only in the creation of wealth but the fair distribution of it. Uh, and in that sense, its origins are, are entirely uh, similar uh, to, uh, uh, to all of those organisations that Thomas was talking about back in the 1890s. Uh, I think we've got to a point where the word populist has been so debased, it's almost uh, meaningless because what I think we need to be talking about is whether parties have got an inclusive agenda or whether they've got an elite agenda. Uh, and what we see through neoliberalism is an elite agenda tax cuts uh, for the wealthy, deregulation for the powerful, cutting holes in the social safety net, wage suppression and so on, uh, which is the opposite of a, of, of a, of a populist agenda, uh, but has been taken up by right-wing populists, if you like, uh, and enshrined in the community on the back of the demonisation of government. So the big challenge that uh, parties of the, of the centre-left have uh, is to highlight uh, the use by so-called right-wing populists uh, of an agenda uh, which delivers to the few at the expense of the many. Um, Ooh, that's, Tom, can I throw, throw in there? Yeah, so yeah. I, was just, I was talking to one of, my, one of my friends, Jim Hightower. He's one of the last guys in America who forthrightly calls himself a populist and embraces the term in the old fashioned meaning of it. And he always says, it's not about left and right, it's about top and bottom. It's about those that have and those that don't. And that is always the message. You know, I was reading a Wayne, I was reading a book uh, by an Australian author called Populism Now! Exclamation point. And he pointed out a fact that I did not know, which is that when the Australian Labor Party was founded, they considered calling themselves the People's Party in homage to, that was the official name of the Populist Party in America. They considered calling themselves that because the Populist Party in America at the time looked pretty good. <laughs> Exactly. So, so the first Labor government in the world, Thomas, was in Queensland, my state, uh, in the 1890s. Sorry, in, yeah, in the 1890s. So um, there's a fine tradition here, uh, as there is in other parts of the country and other Labor parties around the world, uh, of, uh, of populism, if you like. Yeah. Um, ben Oquist, can I ask you, why do you think Australians have such a fascination with uh, American politics at the moment? And... Uh, we're seeing this uh, anti-populism um, sentiment come through so strongly in this political moment. Well, uh, great question, Ebony. Maybe I'll um, answer it with another question, which um, is partly 
because of the fascination, obviously, with with uh, Donald Trump, and um, that, I mean, maybe even more so to Australians and a majority of Americans, we just don't understand um, how seemingly such a uh, corrupt, um, incompetent leader can do so well politically, um, and why um, why Donald Trump won in the first place. And I, I guess my question to Thomas is in a way, what is it about uh, Donald Trump that is not um, populist? Because in, in some ways he represented the assault on, well, not the elites, but the establishment. He even took over the, the establishment of his own party. He was successful because uh, um, elites had let down so much of the American uh, population. And why isn't Donald Trump a populist and I, and I think that's that's part of the problem with the debate is that uh, he's been presented as a kind of antidote to the establishment um, yeah. by some and it's he's given populism a bad name um, so taking us all the way back from um, your writings from the 1890s I wanted to throw us forward right to the present and what, is, what does populism and it, uh, it, its misuse tell us about Donald Trump? It, it tells us that we are one hell of a confused society. Okay. And, uh, you know, and I, I, look, I share your sentiments exactly. I, I, so I was writing a book during 2015 when he was making his, you know, his bid for the Republican uh, leadership. And I, and I finished the book and turned it in. And my kids, you know, told me, you know, Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. And I was like, what you know the, the guy the guy on tv you know that, that the asshole am i allowed to say that by the way uh yeah okay? we can we can do a writing for it later <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know this guy who says you fired you know he, this is his famous catchphrase that guy is going to be the republican and not only that but then he's but he you know so on the uh, uh why is he not a populist because well for one thing he's a He's a bigot, and the populists were the guys in the 1890s, and then sort of neo-populists in the 1930s were the people on the other side who fought the, you know, who tried to um, bring races together, uh, you know, people from all different backgrounds together based on class interest. That's what that's what their grand motivating idea was, and his is his is not that. And you also look at, of course, what he's done as president, which is the, the what's his great one great achievement is a huge tax cut. For the very wealthy, and also the you know he's deregulated massively, uh, you know. And here in the in the pandemic, you know, he's done these incredible bailouts of big corporations. By the way, there was just a hearing today in America. Talk about a populist moment. There was a hearing of the the four big uh, 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 leaders of you know the CEOs of the big tech companies, which are these gigantic you know uh, people with fingers in every aspect of American life, and they behave. Uh, like monopolies, you know, and the populists would have known exactly what you do with these people. You break them up, <clears throat> you throw the weight of the law at them. Trump has done nothing against these people. By the way, neither did Obama and neither did Bill Clinton before him going back to Reagan. Now then on the plus side is Trump's rhetoric. You know, let's, let's be honest. The guy, uh, the guy did, uh, try to talk, you know, make talk in a way that made uh, blue collar workers and, uh, you know, a certain kind of, of person feel like they were being listened to and they were being cared about in a way that the Democratic Party, which is the traditional party of labor in America, has long since stopped doing. And Trump is not the one that invented this, remember. He, it, you know, uh, George W. Bush was very good at it, pretending to be a kind of man of the people. Uh, Ronald Reagan was excellent at it. Newt Gingrich even was good at it. And the man who invented it was Richard Nixon. There's been this whole series of, of uh, very conservative politicians, each one more conservative than, the, than their predecessor, who have been very, very good at uh, pretending to care about your values and pretending to care about middle Americans, but then, of course, advancing an agenda that's really different. There's a, okay, I'm shutting up because you don't want, you don't want to know the nuts and bolts of American politics, but there are so many fascinating aspects to this. No, so we, what we, people we, do, we do want they to know are the bots and bolts, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so is it, is it that Donald Trump harnessed populism, but then abandoned it or did he never had, a, never had it? 
I think so. There were there were some issues where Trump was a uh, was was genuinely to the left of Hillary Clinton. The main one being trade. Uh, the uh, you know the American uh, labor unions have been up in arms about the different trade agreements signed in the Reagan era and how these agreements were designed to deindustrialize the United States, which is correct. Uh, and uh, Trump caught on to that outrage. Uh, and talked about it constantly, would, would visit these factories where they were laying everybody off, et cetera. He did this all the time. Now, <laughs> if you look beneath the surface, he had no idea what he was talking about. He had no idea. He knew that this was a winner. He knew that the audiences would applaud. They'd go crazy when he talked about it. But he didn't, he didn't understand at all. And uh, you get that sense about so many of the things he said. He, he, among other things, he said he, was, he had opposed the Iraq war. Hey, that's great. He said, uh, we need to stop these endless wars. I agree with that. You know, that sounds good to me. He went after the Demo Democrats for being too soft on Wall Street. Yeah, that's right. They were. <laughs> and he did nothing <laughs> on any of these things. He didn't mean a word of it. It was all just nonsense that he could see. Got and um, the, the, what is fascinating about it, and this is all in addition to the outright bigotry, which he was also using, you know. What is fascinating about that is that these are things that Republicans never would have dared to say in the past. They would hint at it. You know, they would use uh, certain uh, phrases that sounded like they, they were going there. They, they love to pretend to be on the side of the, you know, sons of toil. I, I had this great quote in the book from Ronald Reagan saying something like, you know, I don't like to hang around with these executives. I like to, you know, I like to, uh, to, to be in the factories with the people who have calluses on their hands. You know, sure you do, Ron <laughs> Ronald Reagan says the guy who, you know, destroyed labor in the United States. But they say stuff like this all the time. You think of Richard Nixon talking about the, the silent majority and their, you know, and their values being trampled down by the cultural elites. And, and I guarantee you, Trump is going to try it again this time with the culture wars, which are always this kind of fake populist thing about ordinary people with their, <clears throat> with their humble ways being trashed by the despicable you know, uh, publishers of the newspapers and masters of the you know, TV networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's phony. It's fake. Uh, it's, it, it sounds good to some people, but it's complete BS. They mean none of it, and they've been doing it for years and years and years, and uh, all they want to do is cut taxes for their buddies. Um. Wayne, did you um, have anything that you want to add to that about what we're observing in the United States at the moment? I think you're on mute there, Wayne. I wanted uh, Thomas to, uh, to tell me whether he thought there was some hope for optimism, uh, given uh, what the pandemic is actually doing now uh, in communities to the economy and doing socially. Uh, is, does, does Thomas think that, um, you know, this is going to demonstrate some of those very grave inequalities uh, that have come uh, through from um, the trickle downers, such as uh, the nature of insecure work, low pay, uh, the inequality in the labour market, uh, and the dual, if you like, representation that, in fact, it's those sort of workers who are just as essential in our economy as the high paid executives. Does, yeah. does, does this demonstrate... Uh, give, give us hope for uh, a political agenda uh, as we go forward into the presidential election? And does it also, I think, demonstrate uh, some of the dangers of, of a pretty rank corporate culture in the United States, where, you know, you've got a race to the bottom when it comes to paying tax, uh, you've got casualisation of the workforce, low paid workers. Do those two trends, which have been opened up by the pandemic, provide a way in which the Democrats uh, can move, if you like, further to the left? Uh, and come through with a much more traditional progressive agenda. Oh, I wish it. Of course, it it opens that that window up. It's it, this is going to be shocking to an Australian audience, but in America, you only have health insurance if you're employed by you know a certain kind of employer. You can you know once and and of course there's you know huge unemployment now as a result of this pandemic, and so people are losing their health care left and right. Now you can buy it now on what are called these exchanges, which uh, were set up during the Obama administration, but they've got 
all kinds of problems. The uh, a lot of the, the insurance policies that they anyhow, it's a it's a ridiculous system that where all the reforms were set up so as to preserve the insurance industry in there. <laughs> you know, we want to both have universal care and have this extremely profitable insurance industry and pharmaceutical industry, and it's a a royal botch. It's just a huge mess. And it's it's incredibly obvious in this pandemic what a what a what a disaster the system is, and yes, it would provide a great space for the Democrats to run to the left. Now, however, I I have to throw in here. I have a, I'm very critical of the Democratic Party as well as 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 the Republicans, uh, and in in this book as well as in my and you know this one, and I talk about it all the time. Uh, the Democratic Party is. Uh, when they look at people like, say, Bernie Sanders, who was proposing a kind of uh, universal health care system in the United States, you know, setting that up, they regard a figure like that with a kind of horror. And the party tends to come together or the, the leadership of the party tends to come together to figure out ways to keep a guy like that out. And they did exactly that and were able to keep him out there uh, about six months ago. They were holding these debates among the Democratic candidates and you know, they know that uh, that Bernie Sanders, that, that universal health care is popular. You know, they know that Bernie Sanders is popular, et cetera. And they were all trying to mimic his uh, solutions. But then once, uh, you know, the things developed, uh, Barack Obama made a few phone calls and uh, they all dropped out of the race in favor of Joe Biden, who then proceeded to uh, to beat Sanders. And now Biden has said, absolutely not. We're not going to have universal health care in America. We might, you know, beef up the Obamacare system, but no, we're not going to have what you guys have in Australia. And they just uh, yesterday, I believe, codified that into their uh, platform, to, to their platform for this election year. Bottom line is, um, if, they, if they had to say that to beat Donald Trump, they'd say it. I don't know whether they deliver, but they don't think they need that to tr beat Trump. Trump has proven himself such a bungler uh, that uh, and look, you've got like fifteen percent unemployment here. Nobody really knows. There's a mass die-off of small businesses. People are so angry in America right now. Uh, yeah, Trump is almost certainly going down. Um, and so they don't. They don't have to deliver. That's I, it, it, one of the great things about populism is that the two-party system needs to be shaken up every now and then. You got to have some outsiders come in and just you know expose the folly of the whole thing and we've in america we we've after populism happened we cracked down on that we made that basically impossible so it, so it would never happen again they took all these measures all over america and the states to make sure that this would never happen again and we could really use something like that right now ben did you have Sorry. another question for thomas before we go to yeah which is something we were talk wayne and thomas were talking about on air off air just before we came on air was the differences though between uh, Biden and Clinton and whether there was something more in Biden that would enable him one uh, uh, to win and two to harness that, um, uh, that he has harnessed that uh, populism and he doesn't come with the same in the past and he doesn't come with the same baggage as Hillary Clinton that potentially is a glimmer of hope. Yes, that's, I, I wrote an uh, article for The Guardian about this uh, I'm I'm not a big fan of Joe Biden. I, I you know I didn't vote for him in the primaries, and uh, you know he's got a lot to answer for if you ask me over the over the, his long 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 career as a as a senator from Delaware. On the other hand, Biden occasionally has these moments where he says things that are really perceptive and really wise about. Um, you know, uh, working people and their the frustrations that they face in their lives. He used to they used to call himself middle class Joe, and he was sort of proud of the fact that he was the least wealthy member of the United States Senate. And he would ride home. He didn't live in D.C. He would ride home uh, every week on a on a you know on the train back to his hometown. And uh, I was reading a. Um, I know I, I don't know if you guys care. Oh, yeah, you do care. So I'll tell you the you story. Care. So he the, he got interviewed by the New York Times editorial board, right? They were interviewing all the different Democratic candidates. And uh, it was a, you know, really long interview. And it was just filled with usual, the usual political nonsense, you know, Biden trying to take claim for every, take the credit for everything good and 
distance himself from everything bad. And then at the very end, he told this anecdote about the 2016 election, which was such a fiasco for the Democrats, where he said that the Democratic Party had, uh, that some Clinton operatives had told him that he had to, when he was out giving speeches on her behalf, he had to distinguish between progressive values and working class values. And Biden, you know, uh, sort of, you know, took umbrage at this. And he, and he, and he starts sort of lacing into the New York Times editorial board saying, you know, in fact, you smart people, you think you've got, you, you, you understand the world and you are the bearers of progressivism. But in fact, working class people, you know, if you, if you, if you put the questions to them in the right way and speak to them in the right way, are actually much more progressive than you are. And he said this in a, I thought, a really awesome way. And so I think there is hope for Biden. And he certainly won't, he will never, you remember Hillary's great mistake in 2016, uh, was the deplorables remark. She, she referred to a big part of this country as the population of America as deplorables, you know, people with, with, with horrible values. And everybody could instant, you know, Hillary has been uh, tagged, I think you know, unfairly in my mind, but has been tagged as an elitist for, for decades by the American media. And everybody all of a sudden was like, oh my God, she's talking about me. She thinks I'm deplorable. And Biden will never, make that mistake that's one and he also you know he's just not a hated figure in the way that she was and i think she was uh, don't get me wrong she was hated unfairly it was not it was you know it was not it was not fair that she, that what what happened to her but uh biden is by no nowhere near as unpopular and it's largely because of his sort of blue collar sensibility thanks we might go to uh q a with the audience now um <clears throat> the first question i'm going to ask is from alistair mccullough who asks uh if i am against populism am i necessarily in favor of elitism thomas <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it depends because the word is the word has changed so much. I don't expect anybody to know about you know the the the, the definition of that word in 1891 in Kansas. I don't expect any Australian to know that. I, I wrote this book to tell the world about to tell the world that story, and so no, you're off the hook. You don't have to worry about about me criticizing you or anything like that. However, that said, the the sort of anti-populist. Uh, theory that you see all over the place uh, in you know political science departments and stuff like that has a very elitist edge to it because it's always about counterposing the ignorant masses versus the intelligent um, elites the people with you know the people with phds the whole model when anti-populism went from being a right-wing phenomenon to being a phenomenon of the center left the whole model was this, this sort of managerial idea of American democracy where the way you got reform and the way you got prosperity was by having a whole bunch of different elites or lobbyists or whatever sitting around a mahogany table in Washington, D.C. and making the decisions. That's how, you know, that's how uh, good things happen. That was the model. And it's an elitist model. I mean, obviously. And those are the people who like to use the word populism to trash working class movements. I mean, to this day, that is the implied, you know, philosophy when you, when you do that, when people do that. Um, I was really struck by one quote uh, at the beginning of the book where you kind of summed up the, the hysteria and anti-populism that kind of was ushered in after 2016 was that um, if the people have lost faith in the ones in charge, it can only be because something has gone wrong with the people themselves. Can you just yes. explain that sentiment for us a little bit? So there's a whole bunch of quotes in the, in the, at the start of the book. Some of these quotes are just are, are so crazy. People were hysterical in the year 2016, and they're hysterical to this day. But uh, there's a whole series of, of outrageous quotations of American pundits and um, political scientists and think tankers uh, basically denouncing the people and saying what we, you know, what we need in this country is a little more respect for, uh, for the elites, you know? <laughs> for, uh, and it's always, of course, that what the guy means is for people like myself, right? The author, right? Whoever is saying this, he always identifies with the elites and, and is demanding that, uh, you know, that, that, that people uh, pay him more mind. And it, br it, it, brought, it brought me back to that great quote from Bertolt Brecht, you know, it, if only we could dissolve the people and elect another. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about East, East Germany back in the communist days, of course, but yeah. 
Um, Wayne, I wonder if I might ask you about um, where we find ourselves at the moment in Australia after the outcome of the 2016 election and uh, sorry, the 2019 election and your reflections on that in this context of uh, populism. Well, certainly, because we took a very progressive uh, platform to the last election uh, and, and one that's certainly very progressive, particularly in US terms. Uh, progressive in terms of the distribution of wealth and income, progressive in terms of industrial relations, the social safety, you name it. Uh, and we suffered uh, a very narrow electoral defeat. Uh, and we suffered that electoral defeat uh, amongst uh, lower income people in outer suburban areas and in regional Australia. So there's a pretty uh, significant debate about uh, how Labor should respond to that. And as you know, we uh, went through a committee of inquiry. And I don't think the problem with our offering at the last election uh, was the progressivism of the agenda. Its, uh, its shape was good. I think overall its content was pretty good, but I think it was pretty large. Uh, and I think this was one of the problems that emerged in uh, the primaries in the United States uh, recently. Um, uh, a number of candidates who had very progressive policies had four or five of them at once. Uh, and I think the problem in our election was that we had some very big progressive policies. Uh, when they were all joined together, they were made to look pretty scary by, by the right. Uh, and our policies were easily demonised uh, in the establishment media. As a consequence, we had a very narrow election loss. So when you're a progressive party, whether you want to call us populist, whether you want to call us social democrat, uh, you have to actually get a good balance uh, between the progressive nature of your policies and your capacity to get elected. So there's always this balance between the program you take forward uh, and the program that will win you the 50% plus one so you can get into a position of, taking, uh, of, of winning office. So I think we've been through that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, those lessons, if you like, in the party you know, in the process of putting together, I think, a progressive agenda, but one which makes us electable. Uh, we don't end up in the position that we were after the last election. This um, pandemic, I think, changes a, a lot of that debate. I mean, it, it's, it demonstrates the need for sound industrial relations policies, the likes of which we put forward at the last election. It demonstrates the case for a strong investment in health and education. And it particularly demonstrates why the inequality that you get out of the trickle down agenda from the government doesn't work and is not in the national interest. So I'm optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic about the future of progressive politics, both here and in the United States, because this pandemic really demonstrates uh, why a strong social democratic state is necessary. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Carmela Gallo, I'm going to come to you to ask your question live in just a second. But first, I think I've got a question here from Max Hooper that I think follows on from some of what Wayne was talking about there. Thomas, he asks, um, what have uh, the modern parties of the left, and I think you, you're talking about the, the US context only here, um, have centralised decision-making power in a factional-based system and the concentration of decision-making in few and fewer hands as union representation in particular has shrunk and the vested interests and think tanks of which obviously the Australia Institute is one do tend to play a greater role. How's that phenomenon manifesting itself um, in the United States and in the, the, the Democratic Party? Uh, it's, you know, it's in, it's in high gear and it's been running for about uh, 30 years. So the Democratic Party uh, at some point in the and I trace this in the book, by the way, at some point in the 60s and 70s, it was a gradual transition, decided they didn't want to be the party of labor anymore. I mean, once upon a time, as you guys know, the American Democratic Party was very, very, very closely identified with, with organized labor. And they decided at this time in the 60s and 70s that no, union members were in fact reactionaries and they we're very open about this. And in the, the real, uh, you know, the, 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 the right constituency, the constituency that's really inspiring is uh, college kids, you know, the young, this is the age of Aquarius, all that, you know. And um, they, uh, th this transition took many years, uh, but basically over the years, they became a party where the, the leading constituent group is the sort of professional class. And the Democratic Party acts as a, uh, very, very much in the class interests of highly educated people. Uh, they run the Democratic Party. They identify with the Democratic Party more and more and more. You can see that's who 
votes for the Democratic Party. It's people with, uh, you know, who've been to college, people with advanced degrees. And here's what the tragedy of all that is that, uh, well, the, 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 the incredible obvious blunder of all that is that it's, it's left the Republicans open to, you know, uh, to reach out to uh, these blue collar voters with this, these ridiculous culture war appeals and the, you know, the sort of Trumpism. But the other thing is that the, the message of populism is that you, the way you get uh, social democracy or the way you, you get economic reform, the way you reform a capitalist system is with mass movements of ordinary people. There, there is no other way to do it. If you put a bunch of professionals in charge, that's, you know, they're not, they're not interested in that. They're interested in being, you know, in their fellow elites and they serve their fellow elites, they bail them out, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure they don't get prosecuted. You know, all the stuff that happened in the last decade here in the United States, you have to have a mass movement of working people. And that is so far from the consciousness of the mainstream Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, I've, I've actually talked to, you know, Democratic Party leaders at, about exactly this question, why they won't, you know, the, the labor movement in America has shriveled and shrunk and, you know, it's down to something like, geez, what is it, like 6% of the private sector workforce. I mean, it's shameful. And the Democrats have let this happen. They've let their own, you know, main constituent group uh, die, basically. And it's, this is, this is a disaster, you know, not just for their electoral chances, but for any kind of, you know, notion of, uh, you know, of economic reform. I want to say one last thing, that right now, you know, the, the message of populism is the importance of mass movements, mass movements of ordinary people. And there's a great theorist of, of populism, of American style populism, died a couple of years ago. And he said that when you're building a movement like the farmers movements in the 1890s or the labor movement in the 1930s or the civil rights movement in the 1960s. He said that you, it, you, know, you have to put together a gigantic coalition of ordinary people. This is the only way to do it. And in order to do that, you have to practice what he called ideological patience. And I love this term, ideological patience. You have to remember you're working with people who didn't go to graduate school. You're, ha you're working with people who don't know the lingo who often have, you know, have very traditional views about all sorts of subjects. You can't just be judgmental towards them. And here in America, the, the left is on a kind of uh, doing the exact opposite of that. We are in a race to purge and to kick people out and to proclaim ourselves to be, you know, more radical than everybody else. And uh, it's, it's like one of those reality TV shows where we all think we're, it, everybody else is going to get canceled and we're going to be the last guy on, left on the island, you know, and we're going to have the whole damn thing to ourselves. We're going to be the left, you know, the, the purest one of us all is going to, is going to kick everybody else out. And, it, you know, that is a recipe for disaster in so many ways. I agree with that. I agree very much with that, Thomas. And one of the interesting trends that we're seeing uh, at the moment in response to the pandemic is a, a renewed growth in union membership. Um, as people in the workforce uh, discover uh, how much more vulnerable they could be in, uh, in this sort of crisis moment. So now is a very good opportunity uh, for parties of the centre left uh, to be much more active at the grassroots level, to be much more active in recruitment and to broaden the base as much as possible. Because there is a tendency, as Thomas said, uh, in all political parties for purists to think that everyone has to be exactly on the same page on every single issue. And that's not the case. Uh, what you have to do is you have to build a coalition across the board if you're gonna take on the power uh, of big capital. I mean, we've got to a point uh, in our economic life where uh, income and wealth is incredibly concentrated at the top. They use it viciously during elections as they did in our last election with the deployment of uh, tens of millions of dollars by Clive Palmer. That can only be beaten by people power and only be beaten by a coalition of groups uh, on, on the centre and the centre left. And I have a funny anecdote for you, if you want to hear it. Uh, please. Yep. <laughs> so the original, the, the original anti-populist hysteria of 1896 was this fascinating moment in American life where what, what actually happened, it, it's, it's a little more complicated than I told you at first. The Democratic Party had nominated a guy uh, who opposed the gold standard. His name was William Jennings Bryan. He was a, a fantastic orator. And, uh, uh, and the, the populists saw this and said, well, this is our chance. And so they also nominated him. They said, we're going to get together and beat the Republicans in this way. And the, um, 
the sort of uh, uh, ruling class of America went, went absolutely berserk and started, you know, the sort of hysteria yeah. that I told you about at the beginning. And one of the, the, the funny little episodes in this, the Republican candidate for president was a guy called William McKinley. He was kind of a cipher, but his right-hand man was a, a, a tycoon from Cleveland, Ohio. His name was Mark Hanna. And Mark Hanna was a, a, a genius at this game that you're talking about, Wayne. And he actually at one, you know, he raised uh, by some measurements, the most money that has ever been spent in a, in a presidential campaign in American history, even more, if you define it in a certain way, then they then they raise and spend today. And he outspent Brian twenty to or thirty to one. We don't really know because there were no requirements they, to uh, you know they didn't have to tell you how much they raised and spent. But at one point during the campaign, he went door to door in Manhattan to the you know the headquarters of the Fortune five hundred. This is the Republican campaign manager, and he says, "Open the books." He goes into their headquarters, and says to the CEO, "Open the books." The guy does. He says, you made X number of dollars last year. We're taking, you know, such and such percent of it for the Republican campaign for president because the class war is on. And if this guy, Brian, gets in, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be like the French Revolution down there in Wall Street, <laughs> you know, and they did it. They paid the money. And Brian here, he didn't have a campaign. I mean, it was just him. He was going around the country in what, what they used to call a day coach, which just means, you know, a passenger car. And, and uh, he would sleep in the train stations. He had to carry his own suitcases. And then he would get off somewhere and give a speech. You know, he, he was young and strong, so he could pull it off. But he had nothing. And they just, they just wailed on him in the most, well, you, you see the, the, the sort of the residue of it on my, on my website, I, the, the, the funniest stuff. I mean, it, it, wouldn't, it would be funny if it wasn't so horrible what they did to him, but they crushed this guy. With money. Um, yep. Carmela Gallo, do I have you on the line there? Do you have a question for the panel? Um, I think I may have accidentally put put the hand up. Um, That's all so right. I don't have a question. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> I'm really sorry to put you on the spot then, Carmela. <laughs> um, all right. The next question then, I think, takes on power in a different way, uh, although it is linked, obviously, to big capital. But Mark Merritt asks, it's all well and good to talk about political players and try and understand their motivations, but what role does the media and media owners, the banks and industrialists play and how do they fit into all of this? Thomas, what would you like? In, in, here in America? Yeah. So we're in this very interesting time in America where the, uh, you know, uh, the newspaper industry is, is falling to pieces. So I'm here in Kansas city. Here's our, here's our, uh, newspaper, the Kansas City Star. When I was a kid, this was one of the great newspapers of America. I mean, one of the greats. Uh, today, it's uh, about, you know, seven or eight pages, uh, mostly wire service copy. And I, I don't mean to give them a hard time about it. it. And it just got bought by a hedge fund two days ago. It had a big story and it just got bought by a hedge fund, right? Owning a newspaper. And um, this is happening everywhere. I'm not singling them out for criticism. They do their best. I mean, there's, there's uh, something like 12 uh, reporters now working. This is a city of 2 million people, Kansas City. There's 12 reporters. This is an incredible disaster and it's happening everywhere. And the only exception are the, uh, the three big newspapers in this country, the, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. And if you leave the Wall Street Journal, my former employer, if you leave them out, you know, the other two are in this little media ecosystem where everybody knows everybody else. Everybody comes from the same exact same background. Always these Ivy League uh, colleges here in America. They have the exact same views about the world. So in the surviving, the, you know, the, the media that's going to make it, it's just this tiny little world where everyone is in agreement with everyone else. And it's a it's a I mean, it's it's. It's incredibly dysfunctional. I, by the way, to you know, to publish my stories now, I have to go to uh, uh, British and French newspapers <laughs> because the media market in America is such a mess. But I don't, I don't want to complain about it too much uh, you, because then on the you have on the, also you have at the same time the this invention of Rupert Murdoch, this genius thing called Fox News, which has captured the minds 
of this certain segment of the American population. And, uh, you know, does this kind of fake populism backlash thing that I've been talking about, this culture war thing where it's like, oh my God, middle America, look at the crazy stuff that's going on out there in your streets. Look at the nutty things that people are saying. Can you believe how your tidy little world has fallen apart? And you're sort of elder, you know, elderly white people in America look at this and they're like, oh my God, we got to have law and order. And it's, this it, is a well-known phenomenon in America. It has captured the, the minds of, and I, I've seen it to happen to family members of mine. One day they're normal people, you know, with normal <laughs> And like, and like a, 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 you know, their feet on the ground, you know, and then the next day they're, they've, they've fallen for this kind of hysteria. It happens. Well, Tom, Thomas, it's worse in Australia than it is in the United States. There's more pluralism in the media in the United States than there is in Australia. And I oh, can't, is that right? Is that right? I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't think there's ever been a time where the conventional and established media have been more in the pocket of a government in this country than now. Uh, which is one of the very big challenges that progressive movements face. The good news is that parts of that media become more irrelevant by the day and the, and the technology is available to us if we, uh, if we can get the resources to, to go around them via social media. But there's a very, very big problem for uh, the Labor Party and progressive parties in Australia when it comes to the media environment that we are, we are in. Uh, it's a very challenging one, which is why the points we made before about uh, mass movements, recruiting more members, uh, getting more people involved, building, building coalitions uh, is more important than ever. Um, ben Oquist, I wonder if you might uh, want to reflect on where the Australian media is currently and how that plays into populism like Wayne was talking about. Well, we've got, a, a, in some ways, a much uh, more concentrated and at the same time, a more uh, diverse media. Of course, its, um, uh, its business model is uh, struggling and public broadcasting in Australia is under pressure from a, a government that has been uh, cutting it. It does present uh, opportunities if people can get organised, um, more philanthropic support, um, pressure the government not to cut the, uh, the ABC. But the current business models for media mean that traditional models are struggling. And then on the other hand, um, um, Australia's already, always had a fairly concentrated media market, much more owned by News Limited than in, in uh, other countries. So I, I think um, how in, in a democracy, um, with a kind of collapsing public square and a, a shared public square is a real big challenge for um, mass movements that um, build coalitions. When, when you've got a media market that's kind of segmenting under these pressures and people are tuning into just their own channels and there isn't a kind of shared, as much of a shared media anymore, make, building these mass movements that, as Thomas said, inevitably involve um, compromise and not agreeing on everything all the time straight away. Um, I think that makes it, 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 it much a much tougher environment. One of the things we strive at the Australia Institute to do is, is to um, be pragmatic and not think you have to agree with everybody all the time. But I think our current media models that are segmenting and meaning people are uh, tuning into just their channel make that even harder uh, and I, I think it's um, yes mass mobilization and mass uh, populism is essential for progressive change but I think the the dynamics at play now make that harder um, political parties all political parties have uh, hollowed out in that kind of loss of trust in politics and uh, uh, trust in government. Having said that, um, we are at a, an unprecedented time when um, people have tuned in more to governments as a potential solution, both in the health crisis and the economic crisis. And of course, many governments have failed in that and that can turn people off government and politics even more. But there is a potential to tune into that um, new belief in government, uh, politics, uh, the role of the state in solving an economic and health crisis that can be uh, built upon if uh, done uh, cleverly. But one of the things I thought that I'd like to throw to Thomas at is the role of, what is the role of the expert um, in a, within populism, because we're hearing a lot about the importance of listening to experts at the moment, whether on climate change, 
or in the health response. Um, uh, listening to health uh, uh, experts about how to handle the pandemic. Um, it kind of has links back to how to um, listen to climate experts in dealing with climate change. And what's the, what's the tension there between kind of uh, elitism and listening to policy uh, experts? What role do they have in a, in, a, in a populist democracy, if you like? Well, so none of the, the, the populist movements that I studied, like the labor movement in the 30s and the, um, the farmers movement in the 1890s, they, uh, they weren't hostile to experts. What they, they tended to be rising up against economic orthodoxy. That's, you know, so they, they were, they got, the experts hated them, right? The economists of the day back in the 1890s absolutely despised the populists. The, 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 you know, the, the jokes on them though, because it turned out, that the populists were the right were the ones who were in the right. You know, they wanted to get off the gold standard, and the experts of the day were like, "That is crazy! God gave us the gold standard. You know, you can't <laughs> you can't take that away." And so the the so the the uh, the, the doubters, the the scoffers, and the cranks turned out to be the ones who were right. But they they the the populists actually were great uh, admirers of science and of learning. And they, they thought of themselves, they thought of their movement as a kind of university. They would bring all these farmers together out in, the, you know, in a pasture somewhere and have, bring in speakers from back east who would educate them about whatever the subject was, you know, economics or, or uh, what they called political science at the time. And they, they fancied themselves to be uh, you know, very supportive of science and really interested in science, but they had a different model for it. They said that in a mass democracy like ours, where everybody gets to vote, and that's the ideal in the United States, that you have to, the, the, you know, science has to serve the people. Science doesn't get to dictate to the people. Science has to be explained to them, and it has to serve us. And this is actually a recurring theme. This is not in the book, but it's in an article that I just published in um, a French newspaper called Le Monde Diplomatique. There's this long history of tension in America between uh, uh, sort of neo-populists calling for universal health care or other sort of ways of setting up uh, health care, guaranteed health care for working class people. And then this pushback that always comes from organized science, in this case, from the American Medical Association, which is the professional association of doctors. There's a famous story from Canada, which has its own sort of populist history, where uh, a neo-populist party introduced Canadian health care, the, the single payer model in Saskatchewan in 1962. And the doctors were like, uh, how dare you? We're going on strike. And they actually walked off. The, do the doctors walked off the job. It's the most incredible thing. And within five years, I mean, the, the, uh, the public uh, sided with the, um, you know, with the reformers in an overwhelming way. And within five years, every province in Canada had, had single payer health care. And so there's always this balancing thing. They, they, it's not that they want, you know, quack medicine. They want the real deal. They just want it to be affordable. They want, they want medicine and science to serve the people. And the problem is in America, when you, I, I'm, I'm still trying to puzzle this out like everyone in America. The problem is when you order people to, uh, you know, to get in line and to do what the experts say, the, I mean, what, what would an Australian do? An American would be like, hell no. Hell no, you can't tell me what to do. That's just, a, that's just how Americans instinctively react. And so it's kind of a problem. But there, one other thing I wanna say about this and then I promise I'll shut up. You've got this, remember the stories that you were quoting from Ebony where you had all these pundits saying, you know, you have to listen to experts and the experts are right. And we, we've got this terrible problem in America where the, the people don't believe in the experts anymore. What all of those stories leave out and you probably have noticed this in Australia, is this problem of elite failure. And we've had elite failure after elite failure in this country, going back to the Vietnam War, which was, remember, dreamed up by a bunch of political scientists. You know, a bunch of guys from Harvard figured that sweet baby out. And it was a catastrophe, as was the Iraq War, as was the, you know, the financial crisis, as were the bailouts of the Wall Street banks, on and on. The opioid epidemic, which was effectively engineered by, you know, medical professionals. There's been, oh, and not to mention the Hillary Clinton campaign, this debacle 
which was uh, which 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 happened to the the absolutely the best political minds in America were the ones that just walked right into that disaster that couldn't beat the most unpopular presidential candidate of all time, meaning Donald Trump, this complete buffoon whose campaign manager had never managed a political campaign before, and the smartest guys in American politics couldn't beat him. You know, it's like. Every time they tell us that we have to respect elites and we need to shut up and, and you know, and, and do as we're told, I think of all of these examples. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, you got to take that into consideration, guys. Anyhow. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for your time today, Thomas Frank and Wayne Swan and Ben Oquist. And thank you, everyone who's joined us today. We really appreciate you coming along. And we're sorry that we couldn't get to all of your uh, excellent questions. Um, but Thomas Frank's book, uh, People Without Power, is, I got this from Paper Chain in Monica, but it's available at Dimix and all good bookstores in Australia. Um, and thank you again for, for joining us, Thomas. We really appreciate it all the way from the USA. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm in a, th a thunderstorm in Kansas City. By the way, <laughs> this has been wonderful and the pleasure is all mine. Thank you. And please join us over the next few weeks as we have more exciting webinars. Next Wednesday, the 5th of August at 11 a.m., we have the Pandemic Mental Health and Beyond with Julia Gillard. She's the current chair of Beyond Blue and, of course, our former prime minister. That's next Wednesday at 11 a.m. And the following Wednesday on August the 12th, we're going to be speaking to the UN chief economist, Elliot Harris, about how we stay united in a global crisis. Uh, those are, as always, free to attend, but registration is essential. So head to our website at tai.org.au forward slash webinars to register for those. And make sure you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally get all your po podcasts. And in this week's episode, I talked to our chief economist, Richard Dennis, about these latest calls to just let the virus rip and... Uh, That'll be somehow better for the Australian economy. Richard will talk uh, or talks in that episode about the real limitations of economics uh, when it comes to answering some of society's big questions. And as always, stay one and a half metres away, wear a mask if you can, keep washing those hands and stay safe, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ebony. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. That was fun, guys. That was a blast.